Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. Now, of course, it's important for us to see this very familiar passage within its context that we've been studying in Isaiah. We have noticed that this whole section of the prophecy is really the account of how God is going to intervene in his mercy in the misery of his people in Babylon and restore and return them to Jerusalem. And he is going to do that in his grace as a kind of new exodus again and again in Isaiah you discover references to the first exodus recorded in the book of Exodus when his people were brought out of Egypt but here there is the second exodus as it were but again we need to recognize how Isaiah points us forward to that ultimate exodus of which Jesus spoke which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem not to bring his people out of the bondage of a human tyrant but to bring them out of the bondage of sin and bring them into the grace of God now that is what the whole of this second section of Isaiah is about and we have seen how in the previous chapter chapter 51 Isaiah has cried out to God to do this in verse 9 for example of chapter 51 awake he cries awake clothe yourself with strength O arm of the Lord awake as in days of old and he is crying to God to do this thing by making bare his mighty arm. Now in chapter 53 we have this most amazing and mysterious picture of God stretching forth his mighty arm to save and Isaiah says who would have believed that God would have done it in this way? Notice how he says so at the beginning of chapter 53. Who has believed our our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed when it was stretched forth? Because God has done this, not as people would have expected at all by some mighty prince or some conquering king coming onto the scene of the world's misery but by a humble disfigured rejected suffering servant who came in the fullness of time in the person of Jesus Christ and the arm of the Lord was made bare in him Now, here in this fourth servant song, we therefore come in the fullest way in which the Old Testament ever discloses him to us, to the solitary figure of the one who will accomplish the redemption of the people of God. There is no reasonable doubt that Isaiah is speaking of the Messiah and the one who is to come in the day of the Lord. The song begins at chapter 52 verse 13 and consists of five stanzas or strophes as they are sometimes called, just five paragraphs if you like, each of them of three verses. And you will notice how most versions paragraph the whole servant song in that way. The first and the last of these stanzas introduce us to and conclude the theme. And the theme is really best described in the heading that the New International Version gives in almost every edition to this whole passage 
the suffering and glory of the servant. The title really comes, I think, from a great old book by a man called John Brown, The Sufferings and Glories of the Messiah. If you ever are able to find that book, Mr. Berry may well keep an eye open, The Sufferings and Glories of the Messiah by John Brown. It is a most amazing account of this very chapter. But now at this point we need to ask the question which the Ethiopian treasurer asked Philip, you will remember in Acts chapter 8, as he read from this very chapter, of whom does the prophet speak? And the answer to that question is obtained from the rest of the Old Testament and from the whole witness of the New Testament. Because this chapter is the most quoted section of the Old Testament in the New, both by direct quotation and by reference that is very obviously made to it, there is no part of the Old Testament that is more frequently or as frequently quoted as this one is. But in the Old Testament itself, there is an abundance of evidence that the Messiah himself is the figure that Isaiah is referring to. Phrases like the tender shoot and the root out of dry ground in chapter 53 verse 2 are strongly messianic terms. You need to look like prophecies like Zechariah 3, 8. But for the believer, of course, the overwhelming argument is the words of Jesus himself as he identifies himself as this figure. In Luke 22:37, Jesus says, I say to you that this that is written must be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Now here is Jesus speaking the very words of Isaiah 53 and saying, these words must be fulfilled in me. So whatever reference they may have to any other, they have a primary reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now do you notice in chapter 52, 13 at the beginning, and, and I reckon we will come back to this passage next week, the speaker is God himself. He is bidding his people to behold, to look upon, to pay attention to his Son. It is as though the first person of the Trinity is calling attention to the second person of the Trinity, precisely as happened at the baptism of Jesus, do you remember? When God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. And again at the transfiguration, when the heavens opened and Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus, God the Father says, this is my beloved Son, hear him. And here he is calling upon his people, behold, he says, my servant will act wisely. Fix your eyes, he is saying, upon him who is my servant. Now, there is a remarkable sense in which you will notice that here the Lord Jesus Christ is described as the servant of Jehovah. He is primarily Jehovah's servant. He is in another sense the servant of his people, and that is perhaps one of the greatest mysteries in the universe to us. But here God the Son is described as the servant of Jehovah, and what clearly is implied is that in the mystery of the counsels of the Godhead, before the foundation of the world, 
God the Son has willingly submitted himself to the will and purpose of the Father for the sake of the redemption of his people. That's what this means. He is Jehovah's servant. And so you find when the Lord Jesus comes into the world, he comes in this character. I do always those things that please my Father, he says. He is Jehovah's servant. The works that I do are not my own, but his that sent me. The words I speak are not mine, but his that sent me. So that in every possible sense, the Lord Jesus Christ is here as the servant of Jehovah. Now, that is something from which we must not shy away. It in no sense reduces the full deity of the Lord, the Lord Jesus and his equality with the Father. But it does recognize that he has taken upon himself the role of the servant of Jehovah for the sake of the fulfillment of Jehovah's purpose to redeem for himself a people. But in relation to those he came to save, here is the mystery. You see, everything about the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills this identity as the servant. He says, I am among you as one who serves. I came not to be served but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Now this is the fulfillment of this description. Behold, look upon him who is my servant, he says. And notice what he says about him. He will act wisely. Now that really is a difficult thing to translate. It, it says he will deal prudently. It is really saying that he is going to accomplish what he is the servant of Jehovah to do and will do it wisely or prudently. But you know there is another sense in which I think it is true when many scholars suggest that to act wisely in the Old Testament, I remember Alec Motir, to whom many of you will owe a debt for his writings as well as his ministry. He said to act wisely is an Old Testament synonym for to obey God. Because wisdom in the Bible is not simply intellectual knowledge or even discretion and understanding. It is the fear of the Lord at its beginning and that is obedience to God. And here is the servant of Jehovah acting wisely. He accomplishes this redeeming work not by the wisdom of men, but by the wisdom of God. Now, there is something very remarkable about that, you see, because uh, Paul tells us that in, in Romans 15, 8, I tell you, he says, that Christ has become a servant of the Jews that the Gentiles might glorify God. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ becoming a servant of his own people. And when he humbled himself from heaven's glory, this is the role and character that he took on. Well, let me begin by looking with you at the sufferings of the servant of Jehovah and then his glory. You will notice that in this first stanza, verses 13 to 15 of chapter 52, there is an introduction that immediately tells us that this servant who abased himself lower than any servant could have gone, will by God be exalted to a place higher than any king could ever reach. Do you notice this? See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. 
Many people have thought there is actually a reference there to the threefold exaltation of Jesus, his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation to the right hand of God, whatever the truth or otherwise of that may be. And I think the prophet may be speaking generally more than specifically. What he is saying is that he who came to the lowest place of servanthood will be exalted to the highest place of kingly glory by God. Now, there is a unique and awesome character, both about the sufferings and about the glory of Christ, to which we are introduced in verse 14 of chapter 52. You notice that they both produce a reaction of amazement and wonder. Notice in verse 14, you get this phrase, just as, and the NIV helpfully adds a a dash of parenthesis after the phrase, they were appalled at him, and then links it to the beginning of verse 15 with the words, so will he sprinkle many nations, just as, so. So there is a comparison. Now, do you notice what the comparison is? The comparison is between the two occasions when people are going to gasp with amazement. They are going to be dumbstruck. They are going to be aghast at the sight that they see, overwhelmed by something that is altogether outside of normality. And the first thing that is going to strike them dumb is the appalling disfigured appearance of him who will be marred beyond human likeness for the sake of our salvation. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So, now notice this, so will he sprinkle many nations, which is the language of cleansing and purification, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, for what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. What is that of? It is the glory of the Messiah. The day is coming, you see, when just as people have been appalled and dumbstruck by the disfigured countenance of the servant of Jehovah in his humiliation, so kings of the earth will be dumbstruck at his exalted glory in his exaltation. And this is the sufferings and glories, you see, of the Messiah. Now we need to look at the sufferings, first of all. Those who beheld the servant in his suffering, you notice, were appalled. That is, they were struck with a sense of paralyzing horror, one of the paraphrases had it. They they could not have conceived that such horror could ever be witnessed. And we need to use our imagination to try to understand what this means. There are some things even in our own human experience which are of a dimension of horror that we could never really have imagined. There are some people we know, many of us, who were at the Lockerbie Air disaster, for example, Um, You may remember that Carol Chisholm went down there before she married Alan Reed. She was a policewoman, and uh, she went down to Lockerbie. And uh, some of the stories that have come out of that, people who came from ordinary backgrounds, they had to get special counselors, they had to get psychiatrists, they had to get all kinds of people to try to help them to cope with seeing a horror of such a dimension that they could not begin to imagine it. I wouldn't even try to upset you by describing it, but some of these things were just unimaginable horror. They could not have imagined that it existed. 
somebody wrote about the eerie silence I can still remember in the London Times when the screams died away I noted it down there was a strange silence it was the silence of mortal man facing the kind of horror he never imagined existed as they took bodies and parts of bodies from trees now it is something akin to this multiplied by infinity that we are to understand when the prophet says there were many who were appalled at him now what was it that produced that reaction we need to ask well the prophet says it was the deforming and the disfiguring of the Messiah. You notice what he says. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form or image marred beyond human likeness. Now, of course you will know that when Jehovah's servant came from heavenly glory, as Paul describes it to us in Philippians chapter 2, the unique thing about him was that he was the eternal God in perfect human likeness. We beheld his glory, they said, the glory is of the only begotten Son of the Father. It was the Word of God who had eternally been with God made flesh. Now the thing about God made flesh bearing the perfect image of God was that the image of God was seen in the world again for the first time since sin destroyed it. It was seen in perfection. When the Lord Jesus appeared, man made in the perfect image of God was visible in the world once more. And he was there in human likeness, and that manhood was in its perfect glory. But, you see, in the course of bearing our sin, he was so disfigured and the form of his very humanity was so marred that he became unique in being unrecognizable, the prophet says, in terms of human likeness. Now, you will often have known how people will have spoken in times of some appalling thing happened. You could scarcely have told that it was the face of a man. The next stanza elaborates that theme. Do you notice it too in verse 2? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. There was no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now, can you grasp what the prophet is saying? You see, here is Christ come to be the bearer of our sin. And he who was the fairest amongst ten thousand, the bright and morning star, the only begotten of the Father and the perfect image of God. And there is nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Indeed, among his fellows, in verse 3, he is despised and rejected. Now, that's a most extraordinary picture, is it not? What the second half of verse 3 tells us is in some ways still more astonishing. It tells us that looking upon Christ 
stricken with the griefs and sorrows of bearing our sin, men found the sight revolting and turned their faces from him as we would turn away from some mangled figure in a tragedy, unable to bear the sight of it. Now that's exactly what he says, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But of course the real mystery is what had caused this unnameable suffering, this awesome effacing even of the image of man from the servant of Jehovah. What was it that had caused such an extraordinary disfigurement of humanity even? A sight that even sinners would shield their eyes from. Well, there are three reactions that are given to that question by the prophet. The first of them is the human reaction, which is that he was suffering some ghastly retribution at the hand of Jehovah for his own sin. Verse 4, the second sentence of the verse, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. That's the first response. And you will know that throughout the New Testament Gospels, there are places where people say this of Jesus. He casts out devils by Beelzebub, the, the prince of devils. And so they would have said that he was bearing there the punishment of his own sin. And they say this is our conclusion. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Now, when we come to the second answer to the question, what caused this ghastly sight to appear, we discover that there is some truth in what the untutored said. Because the prophetic insight, and this is the second answer, is that the pr in the primary sense, it was our infinity, our our infirmity, our sickness, our sin, our rebellion, our transgression that caused it. In verse 4 at the beginning, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Notice verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now, there is the true answer to the question. You see, it is contained in the biblical doctrine which brings us to the very heart of the meaning of the death of Jesus as the servant of Jehovah. He was the substitute for sinners and bore that suffering in our place. Because the really appalling thing, you see, is that when men gazed on the Lord Jesus Christ and looking upon him said, his appearance is so disfigured beyond that of any man and is far marred beyond human likeness, they are looking at themselves. What we are gazing upon when we gaze on the marred form of the Lord Jesus Christ as our sin bearer, we are gazing upon ourselves and what sin has done to us. And that's the appalling thing. It was our iniquity that he bore. It was our transgression that he was bearing. 
And so there is at the heart of the atoning work of Christ substitution. But there is something more than this yet, you will notice. Because there is a third answer to the question I was saying a moment ago, and the third answer to the question is this. What caused this suffering of the servant of Jehovah to be so intense and so appalling? Now, this is not his physical suffering merely. His physical suffering is rather like the sacrament, the outward and visible sign of the inward reality of what that suffering meant. We may come back to this next Wednesday. But this is the sheer marring of the very image of God in his manhood. And what caused it was not that he was smitten by God for his own sin, nor simply that he was smitten with our sin. The key to it lies at the end of verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So what is it that caused this marring of the Lord Jesus? It is that the Lord laid our sin upon him. Old Octavius Winslow, who wrote a great book on the Holy Spirit, which the Banner of Truth have republished, he says in one place, who was it that caused the death and brought the sufferings of our Savior? And he answers his question, not the Jews for envy, not Judas for silver, but God for love. He bore our sin because the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that's the language of sacrifice, of course. So if the atonement has at its heart substitution, it has as its nature sacrifice. The Lord laying the sins of his people upon him is the figure of the priest. Of course, the priest did this on the Day of Atonement. Um, you can read of this in Leviticus chapter 16, how the priest came and brought this animal out. And indeed, there were two animals that were brought and by symbol, the priest took the sins of the people, as it were, on his hands, and at the command of God, he laid these sins on the head of the animal. And one of these animals was slain and sacrificed on the altar, and the other was sent out into the no man's land, where it was separated from God and men outside the camp. And the Lord Jesus, of course, fulfills both of these pictures in himself. But the sin of the people was laid by the Lord on the head of the substitute. And it had sacrifice at its very heart. Notice verse 10, which repeats this theme. Yet, now, you cannot, can you really, I ask you, can you possibly read these words without a sense of mysterious awe and wonder. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and so on. But this is where the deepest mystery of the atonement lies, that it is God who is at work. Now, as we close this evening, let me just draw your attention to one of the places where this is manifested to us 
in the most amazing way. Look at verse 5. Halfway through the verse you will notice where he is saying, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. If you have an authorized version, you'll find that it actually doesn't say punishment. It says chastisement. Now, chastisement, I understand from scholars who know these things better than I do, chastisement is probably the most accurate translation. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Now, you will recognize that chastisement is different from punishment. It is only a parent who may chastise. A stranger may punish, but it is a father's task to chastise. And Isaiah says to us, he was chastised that we might have peace. Now here in the heart of the meaning of the cross, this is what is happening. God the Father is pouring out upon his Son his wrath and anger over our sin. And as from the depths of the no man's land to which he is banished, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is experiencing the chastisement of the Father upon him. So what is the explanation for this amazing picture? It is not just that he stood in our place. It is that God laid our sin upon him. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Oh, that God would melt our hearts by such truth and enable us to grasp something of the profound mystery of what lies at the very roots of our redemption. Let's pray together. Our blessed Lord, we have no mind to fathom the mystery of redeeming grace. Our lives are too narrow and small to contain even a fraction of the wonder of your love. And now this evening we come to you to pray that you would sanctify your holy word to us. Grant that it may draw out within us such love and gratitude and worship to you that we shall find through endless days of all eternity that we do not have language sufficient to praise the name of our Redeemer. Bless us and go with us this evening and assure us that such love as this has justified and saved us eternally. For the glory of your great name we ask it. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, 
Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.